I think I will go ahead and start. And so I'm just going to begin by welcoming all of you. Thank you all for coming tonight to the Montview Earth Care Speaker Series for 2021. Before we begin, I want to just say a couple of quick things about our Zoom format. During the presentation, I've muted everyone, and I ask you to please stay muted during the presentation because that will improve the sound quality for everyone. Also, you might want to click over to the speaker view so that when Ron is talking tonight, you'll, you'll be able to really zero in on what he's, what he's saying. Um, after the presentation, we will have time for questions. And if you do have a question at any point, would you please type it into the chat? Because of the size of the group, I think it's a little more efficient way to get our questions. Um, I'll get the questions from the chat and then I'll ask Ron and then he'll answer your questions. At the end, I'll invite you to unmute yourselves if you wish, and then anybody can make any comments that they want sort of in person at that time. But hopefully that way we can get everybody's questions answered in a pretty efficient sort of way. So my name is Erica Walker. I am a member of the Earth Care team here at Montview. The Earth Care team was formed in 2018 as part of the process of Montview becoming a certified Earth Care congregation. So we, we received the certification in 2019 and this recognized our efforts to become better stewards of the earth. And it also linked us to the efforts of the five other certified uh, Presbyterian congregations in, in Colorado and to the 276 other Presbyterian churches around the country that are also certified as earth care congregations. So tonight is the first presenta presentation of three in our speaker series. And our speaker tonight is Ron Simpkins. And the title of his presentation is a Christian response to climate change. Ron is a professor of theology at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. He specializes in the area of Hebrew Bible and ancient Near Eastern studies. He is the author of Creation and Ecology, The Political Economy of Ancient Israel and the Environmental Crisis. Welcome, Ron. Thank you, Erica. Erica is going to uh, share the screen. Uh, I didn't want you just to be uh, listening to a talking head. I wanted you to have some kind of visuals uh, as well. And uh, if you find that the slides after a while become unnecessary, you can actually just kind of move your, readjust the size of your, uh, your screen so that the slides are smaller and other faces appear, but that'll just, they'll just appear as I talk and they kind of illustrate some of the issues of climate change. Well, thank you for, for inviting me. I'm, I'm glad to uh, be talking and I, I was telling Erica, this is the first time I've, I've done uh, one of these uh, remotely online. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, uh, in some sense, I feel like I'm just gonna be talking to my computer. So I, I wanna get, so, wish I had more reaction. I could talk to you live and kind of get a feel for you uh, in person, but, but such is the way it is because of our condition right now. So let me start. Uh, tonight on this Earth Day, I'm going to address climate change. My thesis is simple. The threat posed by climate change is real, systemic, and potentially catastrophic. But with concerted action, we can mitigate the worst consequences. And I wanna emphasize the seriousness of climate change, but I don't want you to despair or to lose hope. As Christians, I believe our hope is not dependent on our actions alone. So tonight I'm going to put climate change in conversation with the biblical tradition and suggest how a Christian might respond to climate change. Before I turn to my thesis, however, let me explore the climate crisis in which we currently find ourselves. I hope that everyone recognizes that the burning of fossil fuels, uh, which you can kind of see images of right now, uh, these are the cause of climate change because they emit carbon dioxide. But fossil fuels are only the tip of the iceberg. And unfortunately, this is often as far as the conversation goes. If climate change is imagined as an iceberg with fossil fuels that is its tip, that which is unseen, that which is below the waterline, which is really the larger part of the iceberg, is our economic system, 
which is dominated by capitalism. Around 1800, something unique happened in the long history of humankind. Sustained per capita economic growth became possible. No pre-modern economy was structured to produce economic growth. All were limited by the energy available to them, mainly solar energy embodied in plants. Agriculture only supplied a very modest surplus of energy beyond subsistence needs, limiting the growth of the economy. Wind and flowing water also contributed to the energy supply, but they represented only a small portion of the overall economy. Around 1800, however, a new economic form that we call capitalism, which was structured to produce growth, was wedded to the energy produced by fossil fuels. And the result was sustained per capita economic growth, which materialized as exponential growth in terms of population, new technologies, and the affluent standard of living to which we've become accustomed. Climate, climate change is the consequence of this economic growth. And this is why it is so difficult to address. Capitalism and fossil fuels go together. They are two parts of the single massive iceberg that is climate change. Capitalism requires energy to produce and fossil fuels are the only source of energy sufficient to meet that need. And as capitalism produces economic growth, the need for energy grows as well. Where the pre-modern economies were dependent on the natural flow of solar energy for their production, Capitalism has consumed a stock of solar energy that took millions of years to sequester in the earth. Climate change is the product of our capitalist economy. So let me turn to my thesis. First, climate change is real. Despite the overwhelming science, climate change has become a contentious and divisive issue in political and religious circles. With conservatives of various stripes often denying that climate change is a problem, or rejecting solutions as unnecessary or economically untenable. The reasons for this denial or complacency are complex, but a pro prominent reason is economics. If the scientific consensus on climate change is true, then our current economic system along with its consumption of fossil fuels must change. For many who are benefiting from the current economy, the price is too high especially when the worst consequences of climate change will not be realized for many years. It is easier to reject or simply ignore climate change. Some who are financially or ideologically invested in the current economic system, whether they be neoliberal think tanks or petroleum corporations, have cynically rejected the scientific research, including their own research, and have funded disinformation campaigns to dissuade the public of its truth. Many others are simply complacent because of the economic costs. Even though most US Americans acknowledge the reality of climate change, most are unwilling to significantly alter the economy or prioritize climate change over other economic issues, such as jobs and healthcare. And this is true for many liberals as well as conservatives. But for conservatives and especially conservative Christians, they have rejected climate change because because of environmentalism in general, and climate change in particular have become politicized. Climate change is viewed as part of a package of liberal politics. Despite the fact that George H.W. Bush pledged to fight climate change when its potential effects were first becoming widely known in the 1980s, to by the time his son George W. Bush became president, Republicans overwhelmingly rejected climate change primarily for economic reasons. Barack Obama became president in 2008, campaigning in part to fight against climate change. And then Donald Trump became president in 2016, claiming that climate change is a hoax. Democrats and Republicans by and large have aligned themselves on the issue accordingly. Conservative Christians for their part have largely aligned with Republicans and have shared their skepticism and denial of climate change. Some have even treated climate change along with environmentalism as a neo-pagan or atheistic threat to their faith. But at a religious level, climate change should appear to be uncontroversial for Christians. The Bible, for obvious reasons, does not specifically address climate change. 
but nor does it suggest that humans cannot alter the climate. Instead, the Bible, especially the Old Testament, presents a world in which human behavior, whether it is righteous following God's law or sinful contrary to God's commands, will have consequences in the world. In the covenant tradition of the Bible, a cause and effect relationship is articulated between the Israelites' actions and the conditions of the natural world. If the Israelites do not obey the laws of God, for example, then God will withhold the rain so that the land cannot produce. Climate change could easily be understood to be the consequence of our collective human failure to exercise our divinely appointed stewardship over creation. In other words, with climate change, we are simply reaping what we have sown. That's a biblical idea. The science of climate change, furthermore, doesn't challenge significant theological doctrines. Unlike the debate between creation and evolution, or the many other religious versus science debates where significant theological issues are at stake, embracing the scientific consensus on climate change requires no accommodation in reading the Bible or with Christian doctrine. The recognition of anthropogenic climate change is compatible with the Christian faith. Nevertheless, many Christians continue to reject climate change as incompatible with the biblical worldview, such as the sovereignty of God, despite what the Bible actually says. It's not surprising that many Christians read their Bible in relation to climate change and construct religious beliefs about climate change that are similar in effect to the beliefs of their political and economic allies. All readings of the Bible we have learned are dependent on the context of the readers, their historical social location, their ideology, their identity. Christian deniers of climate change have been shaped by their political and economic beliefs in reading the Bible. Although other readings are possible, many deniers choose such readings that are contrary to climate change because they fit a particular political and economic view, which the potential consequences of climate change threaten to unravel. Second, climate change is systemic. It is a product of our economic system and thus will require systemic change in order to avert the worst consequences. Climate change is not an individual problem. There is little individuals as individuals can do. It is a corporate community problem and only collaborative political action can solve the problem. Churches as they engage with political and social institutions can especially find a role to contribute here. In order to curb climate change and stave off the worst consequences, our economic system, which is, which is responsible for climate change, must decarbonize and radically be transformed. Economic growth, which requires the energy that only fossil fuels can supply, can no longer be the goal of economic policy. Instead, economics must recognize the biophysical limits of this planet and strive for more aspirational goals, such as fostering the well-being of all people and ensuring an adequate social foundation to meet basic human needs. Anything that addresses climate change effectively will at the same time also undermine the capitalist economy, for both are tied to the consumption of fossil fuels. The capitalist economy is dependent on an abundance of fossil fuel energy, but climate change demands that we drastically reduce the consumption of fossil fuels. As a result, we need to transition to renewable sources of energy whenever possible. Unfortunately, we can't presently eliminate fossil fuels. We remain dependent on them for critical transportation and industrial tasks, as well as for the reproduction of a renewable energy system. In other words, we can't make windmills and solar panels and batteries without fossil fuels. As a result, our consumption of energy on which all economic activity is dependent must be reduced. We consume twice the per capita energy of Europeans and Japanese, three times the per capita energy of Chinese, 
four to five times the per capita energy of Brazilians and 10 times the per capita energy of Indians. We can afford to consume less and we must do so to reduce emissions. Renewable energy cannot sustain a high energy society such as we have now. It cannot power a continually growing economy. If we want to address climate change, we must radically reduce our consumption to reduce our production, to free up enough energy from fossil fuels to build a renewable energy system sufficient to sustain a low energy society. Finally, we must address the social consequences of, cap of our capitalist economy, especially the economic inequality that results. And we must do so systemically. Workers must be compensated adequately for their labor with a just and equitable share in the business that their labor has built. A universal basic income would compensate those who contribute to the social reproduction in society without pay. Capitalist property relations have enabled some to claim natural resources as their own exclusive property, robbing nature to which all people on earth should have a share. Thus, expropriation of resources must become appropriation with equitable compensation. A progressively distributed carbon tax on fossil fuels, for example, would produce such a compensation as well as create a disincentive for further consumption. The earth belongs to all its inhabitants. It is given to all in trust by God its creator. So, it should so, so all should benefit from it and have an immediate stake in its care and preservation. Third, climate change is potentially catastrophic. Some argue that climate change even threatened human extinction. I'm not so pessimistic here. Humans have an amazing ability to adapt and I don't really think human extinction is, is a possibility, certainly not any time within the next uh, many years. But climate change does pose a threat to our current civilization. All previous civilizations have collapsed and ours is not exceptional. Simply put, the cost of climate change may be more than our civilization can bear. The collapse of civilization can be understood as a natural event, subject to natural laws, just as natural ecosystems require a constant flow of energy, such as from the sun, so also human society, which is embedded in nature, requires the influx of energy to support not only human activity, but also the complexity that we have in society. Collapse will come about when society can no longer maintain the cost of its own complexity. Human society as part of the natural world is subject to the same ecological limits as all living systems. And while human society may be more adaptable than other species, partly aided by technologies, and thus we can prolong civilization, not even humans can transcend the limits of the natural world. The potential of collapse may be measured in economic terms, but it is equally a strain on ecological systems. It is precipitated by human activity, and as such, collapse also has a moral character. Human-produced climate change is undermining the stability of our society and so we are culpable. One may take a laissez-faire approach to the collapse of civilization, especially when it might not take place until the far distant future. Not unlike how one might approach uh, a natural catastrophe. One could simply claim that it's out of our control. Indeed, this seems to be the dominant political response towards climate change, despite party affiliation and lip service to the contrary. No significant policies have been enacted to mitigate climate change, and few have been considered. Politicians seem content to let nature take its course and adapt accordingly. Let's hope this is changing with the current administration. We've heard a lot of rhetoric today uh, about what uh, the new administration wants to do about climate change, but let's hope that they can match that rhetoric with action. But climate change is not simply a natural catastrophe, such as a, hearth, a hurricane or an earthquake. It is the consequence of human actions, the burning of fossil fuels to empower the economy. 
A laissez-faire attitude is a form of denial that climate change is a threat to the stability of society and that we are to blame. Now, some people are innocent, clearly. They have not contributed to climate change. They have not participated in or benefited from the structures that cause climate change. They are largely the poor of the world, predominantly in the global south, but also found in industrialized nations in the north. Their encounter with our capitalist economy is primarily as victims of its exploitation. Although primary blame for, cap for climate change can be attributed to the class of people we call capitalists who have organized society for their own benefit, blame must also be shared by all those of us who have benefited from capitalism and its economy, even while perhaps also being exploited. This is the majority of US Americans, those in industrialized nations that make up the middle class who have benefited from a growing economy and who consume a disproportionately large share of the earth's resources, including fossil fuels. <clears throat> There's plenty of fault to go around. Climate change is the product of systemic abuse of the natural world and therefore doesn't require intention. We share in a collective guilt by participating in and benefiting from the capitalist system even though individually we might work to reverse climate change in the biblical tradition, collective as well as individual wrong is called sin. And this applies equally to crimes against nature. Finally, let me turn to focus on kind of giving an overview of climate change. Let me turn to focus on a Christian response. Um, this is, the rest is I think, things that many would agree and uh, suggest, but this is kind of my own contribution here then would be the Christian response to climate change. Sin represents a violation, a wrongdoing against God, others, or the moral order that God created in the universe. Climate change is the result of such sin. For capitalists, it's the sin of idolatry, serving the accumulation of money instead of God. The maximization of profit is their ultimate concern. For the majority of us who participate in the structures of climate change, our sin is rooted in our collective failure in preventing the exploitation of people and nature, both locally and globally, while also benefiting from it. The Apple laptop that I'm speaking through on this talk is built with exploitive wages in China from mineral extraction using child labor and violence in the Dominican Republic of the Congo. In order to keep my laptop cheap enough so that I can afford to replace it every few years. Closer to home, the inexpensive food I purchase at the grocery store is made possible by the agribusinesses that maximize their profits in part by depriving farmers of a just price for their products. All who participate in the capitalist system share in the collective systemic sin that has and continues to alter the climate and all the harm that will result from it. As I've already noted, human sin in the Bible is often linked with environmental consequences. Failure to follow God's laws may result in drought and pestilence, whereas fertility and abundance may follow from keeping God's laws. This same linkage is also found in the prophetic tradition. But here the prophets use the condition of the natural world as evidence of the people's sins against God. Thus the prophet Hosea can declare the following, God has an indictment against the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or loyalty, no knowledge of God in the land. Swearing, deceiving, and murder, stealing and committing adultery break out. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore the land dries up and all who live in it languish. The animals of the field and the birds of the air and even the fish of the sea are perishing. Hosea interpreted a drought as a sign that the people of Israel had sinned against God. Even more so, the reference to the animals, the birds and the fish that he makes at the end is a stock phrase used to refer to the creation as a whole. The drought for Hosea not only indicted the Israelites, but also signaled the collapse of creation. This connection between human behavior and the state of creation is even more apparent in the prophecy of Jeremiah. 
Like Hosea, Jeremiah claims that a drought scorching Judah is the result of the sins of the people, and as such is testifying against them. In fact, the people's sins against God are so great that Jeremiah envisions the total collapse of creation. Quoting from Jeremiah, I looked on the earth and lo, it was formless and empty, and to the heavens and they had no light. I looked on the mountains and lo, they were quaking, and all the hills shook back and forth. I looked and lo, and there was no one at all, and all the birds of the air had fled. I looked and lo, and the fruitful land was a desert and all the cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. Linking human sin with natural catastrophes is problematic, however, for the modern mind. Tornadoes, earthquakes, and floods can all be explained by natural causes. When Pat Robertson suggested that Hurricane Katrina was the result of God's anger over abortion, he was widely ridiculed. And certainly his facile theological judgment on the issue had little merit. The biblical prophet's mindset cannot be easily reconciled with what we know about the natural world. But in some ways, the biblical prophets had an advantage that we who share the modern scientific mind have lost. For the prophets recognized no dichotomy between humans and the natural world. Although the prophet's moral understanding was rooted in ancient covenant tradition and worldview that's not directly to the relevant, or excuse me, not, excuse me, that is not directly relevant to the current crisis, they nevertheless recognized that humans were fully part of the natural world, which is God's creation. And thus human actions will have reverberations throughout the natural world. Many in the modern world have been, not, have been denying this at least since Descartes. Climate change is the material corrective to the dichotomy between humans and nature. It is a natural event with human causes. Climate change is the natural effect of human actions that can be called sin. And unlike Robertson's simplistic assessment of a destructive hurricane, with climate change, we can actually detail the causal links, the human burning of fossil fuels to power a continually growing capitalist economy. Climate change is the result of human exploitation of both the natural world for its cheap fossil fuels and human labor for the production of cheap commodities. Climate change is the result of human sin. Just as the prophets could proclaim that Israel's sins had disrupted the creation of God, so also our sin has disrupted our relationship with the natural world, with each other, and with the creator. We have delighted in all the benefits that economic growth has provided, which is made possible by a capitalist economy and fossil fuels without realizing the environmental harm it has produced or for whom it has offered little benefit. Moreover, we've become addicted to, to economic growth, a dependency rooted in our economy and in the social complexity it has produced so that it's difficult to imagine living without it. As a people, we are like the heroin addict who will alienate his friends and destroy his family relations in order to maintain his habit, only to eventually overdose and die if not treated. The creation is sick because of our sins and we must change our ways in order to preserve it. The threat of climate change to bring about the collapse of human civilization demands that we begin to act now on behalf of the creation before the damage is irreparable and the collapse becomes inevitable. We must make big changes to our economic system that can easily overwhelm individuals. Much of the work that needs to be done will involve material changes, changes in how we live and work, changes in what we produce and consume, changes in how we use the land, the water and other natural resources. But we also need to respond theologically and here, individuals can make a significant contribution, especially when united in community as in church. We can reshape the ideology that governs our economy. We can begin by taking responsibility for climate change, embracing our role in it, recognizing it as a result of sin in which we participate, and then assessing and changing our behavior. This is the work of lamentation and repentance. 
Although lamentation and repentance do not always belong together, in the case of anthropogenic climate change, they are needed in concert. The former lamentation mourns what has been lost, while the latter repentance recognizes one's contribution to the loss, makes reparation, and alters one's behavior. Repentance is what affects a transformational change in the person. Repentance demands a change that is necessary to curb climate change. But lamentation lays the groundwork for it. Lamentation provides time and space to acknowledge what has been lost with climate change and to grieve its disastrous effects, as well as to discern how we are complicit in climate change. Without lamentation, repentance may be hollow or performative, or it could simply be put off for another day. Without lamentation, repentance enables us to accept responsibility for climate change without adequately confronting the repercussions of our own wrongdoing or recognizing the severity of the threat. This is yet another form of denial. We protect ourselves by claiming that climate change is simply not that bad and it will and it will impede how we can respond to climate change in the future. With lamentation, however, we recognize the full ramifications of our behavior, our complicity and our sin and the existential threat it poses. When followed by repentance, lamentation prepares us to better navigate an uncertain future because it enables us to fully accept our participation in the sins that have produced climate change. In the biblical tradition, the prophet Joel calls the people to lament and repent in the midst of collapse. Little is known about the prophet Joel. He seems to have prophesied during the Persian period, and he may have served as a priest or a scribe associated with the temple in Jerusalem. In any case, the historical situation that seems to have inspired his prophecy is an unprecedented locust plague and the damage it inflicted on the environs of Jerusalem over multiple years. The people's initial encounter with the plague consisted of a flying swarm of adult locusts passing through the region during the spring around harvest time. The all-consuming destruction of locusts might seem unimaginable to those of us who have not experienced it, but a flying swarm of perhaps a trillion locusts can consume literally all the vegetation in its path and only after all edible food is consumed will they move on to the next region. For agrarian societies like ancient Israel, a locust plague would be followed by the slow starvation of countless lives. And in response to the utter devastation of the plague, Joel calls on the people to lament, addressing four different groups who suffered from the plague, such as farmers and temple priests. Then the prophet issues his own lament. Alas for the day, the day of the Lord is near, and like destruction from the Almighty it comes. Is not the food cut off from before our eyes, joy and gladness from the temple of our God? Desolate are the storehouses, ruined are the granaries, for the grain is withered. How the animals groan, the herds of cattle wander in confusion, for they have no pasture, even the flocks of sheep are appalled. To you, O Lord, I will cry, for fire devoured the pastures of the steppe, and the flame scorched all the trees of the field. Even the wild animals long for you, for the fountains of the water are dried, eat, dried up, and fire devoured the pastures of the steppe. Joel's lament is interesting for two reasons. First, Joel laments with the wild and domestic animals who have suffered from the locust plague. It seems that Joel must convince the people to lament while the animals instinctively know how to lament. Both Joel and the animals grieve how all the vegetation has been consumed by the locusts. He compares the effects of the plague to the damage caused by fire and drought. Second, Joel associates the locust plague with the day of the Lord. In the prophetic tradition, the day of the Lord refers to God's war or judgment on his enemies, often with mythic tropes. Joel uses the expression five times in his book, more than anywhere else in the Bible, interpreting this unprecedented locust plague as God's judgment 
and heralding a final eschatological day of the Lord in which all the nations will be judged in Israel and the creation will be restored. In other words, Joel recognized in the locust plague the beginning of the collapse of creation and thus called the people to lament the devastation. In Joel chapter 2, he sets, perhaps, which is probably set about a year later, the prophet again announces that the day of the Lord is near as a second wave of the locust plague, now in the form of immature hopper bands, or if you will, just lots and lots of grasshoppers, assaults Jerusalem and its environs like an army. Their devastation is no less than the previous year's flying swarm, but now Joel ties the assault directly to the collapse of creation. He claims the earth quakes before them, the heavens shake, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars gather their light. Then Joel issues his call to repentance. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and lamentation. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in kindness, and relents from evil. Who knows whether he will turn and relent and leave behind him a blessing, a grain offering and a drink offering to the Lord your God. Repentance is no guarantee of deliverance. Joel puts forth God's character as the basis for hope, but redemption remains uncertain. His words, who knows, signal his uncertainty. Although Joel never articulates the people's sins, and perhaps it was enough simply to emphasize the natural devastation, he calls the people to devote themselves to God. While lamentation brings clarity to the situation, repentance brings hope. For many other prophets, such as Hosea and Jeremiah, the people's sins made the collapse of creation inevitable. Hope only remained for God's new creation. In contrast, Joel offers hope for a reprieve from collapse, at least in the near term, that God will drive away the locusts and restore the land and its vegetation. The collapse of creation that may result from climate change looms on the horizon. To many people, the possibility of civilization, civilizational collapse is nothing more than a dystopian fiction. The world will continue as usual, it is claimed, and people will continue to prosper as the economy continues to grow. At the very least, the pandemic that we've been experiencing for over a year now is a fitting reminder of our vulnerability. The world can change quickly, and civilization is much more fragile than we generally acknowledge. Facing the devastation of an unprecedented locust plague, Joel called the Judean community to lament the destruction and return to God because the plague signaled the coming day of the Lord. It was the particular disposition needed for his people to endure the catastrophe. Climate change is not the day of the Lord, but it does promise disaster and hardship on many fronts, and it portends the looming collapse of civilization. Thus, we should lament the ruin and loss that is resulting from climate change and repent of our sins. It will enable us to reconcile our affluence, that is our high standard of living, with the damage we have caused the planet, and it will prepare us for the difficult tasks that curbing climate change entails. Let us recognize and mourn what we, what we are doing to the planet degrading its land, polluting its waterways and oceans and emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Let us grieve the loss of countless species with whom we share this planet. Let us acknowledge and lament the exploitation of nature and of other human beings, which makes possible our own affluence. And let us repent and change our ways. Who knows whether we might be able to hold back the coming collapse. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. For all of you, please um, begin to type your questions into the chat and I'll be watching for those. I can pass those on to Ron. 
Ron, while that's happening, I have a question for you. And um, what would you say are some of the most important things, specific things that we can be doing right now? What, what positive action can we be taking? You know, as, as, I, as I kind of start out, this is a, really a community kind of an issue. Uh, there's very little that we as individuals can do, but we can, as individuals, make an awful lot of noise. <laughs> Uh, so to push your Congress uh, persons uh, to make action, to push your senators, uh, to work at the local level with policy that's going on. Uh, this is where I think as a church, you can make a big difference. Uh, you, you come from a prominent church within the city. I'm sure that you, you have ties to different political and social institutions of power and to lean on that and to emphasize that this is this is a matter of this is a matter of sin this is a matter of character this is a matter of something that we need to do because we're at fault and we need to change this uh, I think that's where really where it begins uh, I'm serious when I say at the individual level I think we begin to change the the conversation from one of uh, uh, well simple, solutions such as we just put up a solar panel to ones where we start to really recognize that uh, we have a lot of responsibility involved in this and we need to take some time and recognize the role that we play in this before we can then like any uh well let me let me put it this way there's a reason that alcoholics go through a 12 steps program uh in many ways we are like alcoholics in that regard we need to kind of go through our own kind of coming to terms with our role in climate change before we can then turn around and push society in the ways that it needs to go. And that's really, I think, what the Christian response can be because we really have a way of understanding this whole nature of repentance. Well, we've been through it. This is the basis of our salvation uh, individually, but it's also the basis of our salvation corporately. Uh, and if we recognize this, I think this is something that we can draw upon for strength as we move forward. Great, hey, thank you. I, I'm seeing a, a question here in the chat from Karen Cudabay and she mm -hmm. says, what community lamentations can we follow as models in our churches? I sense a huge resistance to lamenting in community and in public. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, there's, I, I don't have the citation fortunate right now, but I read, uh, uh, a great kind of series of laments over glacier loss, uh, just to to really mourn the fact that these glaciers are no longer there. Uh, and what is left is such a small uh, remnant of what once was there 20, 30, 50 to 100 and farther back years ago. There's, there's not a lot of good models, unfortunately. There are starting to be some models in terms of species loss. Uh, mass extinction, and we, we talk about other species as part of a community, and we can we have some uh, people who have uh, expressed laments in that regard. Uh, in part, that's why I displayed these slides uh, as I was talking, so you can get a sense of what we have lost uh, through the destruction that has occurred. Uh, this can start at an individual level, simply recognizing loss at individual events that we experience. There's no shortage of, of catastrophes, it seems. Uh, we're always getting some of these things in the news. Uh, and just to simply take some time and to begin to lament that. But I think this is where it comes also in community, uh, where as, as church, we can also expect it, it express some of our laments. Uh, I, I attend a Presbyterian church here, and we have time for public confession. Uh, to, to include with that public confession also a time for public lament, uh, I think is appropriate as a way of turning the whole congregation to recognize uh, that which we've lost. And it's simply just um, sometimes a matter of articulating what it is we are losing, what we are afraid of losing, and uh, our helplessness perhaps in those situations and recognizing in all of that, that God is a source of strength and a resource uh, for our own hope uh, as we go through such lamentation. Great, thank you. 
Um, another question here from Jan Fitzpatrick. How do you respond to friends who say, I'm so tired of hearing about climate change. Can't we talk about something else? Yeah, I am so tired of hearing about it myself. <laughs> and I would love for it to go away. <laughs> but unfortunately, it's just not going to. Uh, yeah, and, and partly this is because it's, it's become uh, a he said, she said, they say uh, kind of an argument. Uh, where we, we we just simply parrot political speech sometimes. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't know what to do about that. Uh, a person who I'm really uh, who I really admire is Catherine uh, Hayhoe. She's a Christian climatologist. Uh, she's from Canada, but she works down in Lubbock, Texas, and uh, she's all over the uh, internet uh, on Facebook and other kinds of circles about climate change. And partly because she is a, she is an evangelical Christian and her husband is an evangelical pastor. And she actually had to convince her, pat, her husband that climate change is real. That was a, a kind of a, a dispute in their marriage early on in life. Uh, but, but her, her constant uh, refrain is just to simply, you got to keep talking about it. You just got to keep talking about it. Uh, and talk about the things that you are losing. Uh, it's, it's hard to talk about the things we must do. When I say we have to change our economic system, you know, the initial reaction is, whoa, <laughs> I'm, I'm very comfortable right now. My stocks are doing well. I'm planning for retirement. I don't want to mess with the system. I mean, I get all of that. So if we, if we start to talk about that, what we're losing, and this is where the lamentation again comes in, uh, it changes the conversation uh, to, to something that we can all agree upon. Uh, species loss, uh, loss of uh, good soil, loss of uh, uh, even you know, homes because of uh, fire or flood and other disasters. These are things that we can all feel about and we can all recognize that this is escalating. <laughs> Even if we maybe you're tired of climate change or tired of the particular blame, we can still agree on these kinds of things. And that can kind of move the conversation along, hopefully. Uh, nobody wants to see somebody's house burned down. Nobody wants to see flood destroying whole areas of cities. Uh, this maybe is a place where we can start, I think. So yeah, I'm, I'm tired of talking climate change too, but you know, it is what it is where we still have to deal with it. All right, thank you. So here's another question. This one is from Jeff Ackerman. He says, thank you for the presentation, especially the 12 step program analogy. I'm hearing it here with climate change as well as changing our economic system and in our work in race and white privilege. These are big challenges. Mm -hmm. Similar to Karen's question, how do we learn to acknowledge addiction and start on the 12 steps? And what is the role of the church? Yeah. Yeah, that's maybe variations on some of the same themes that I've been touching on. I do think this is where we can start individually, uh, just as one begins to um, pray and meditate and, and uh, speak with God on one's own issues that one is wrestling in one's own life. Uh, push that into issues that we share in terms of climate change. Begin to uh, talk to God and lament, talk to God in repentance about uh, the situation that we're finding ourselves in in climate change individually. And I think if we can get other believers around us and begin to push that into a church conversation, um, then we can expand upon it even further uh, into a community conversation much more broadly. Um, but it has to start with just conversation, uh, and it can start with one's own experiences. This is, this is personally what hurts me about climate change. This is what scares me about climate change. This is what, uh, uh, this is what I'm afraid of, uh, from climate change and begin with that kind of conversation. Um, and then we can, I think, uh, move into more formal uh, acknowledgement of kind of communal or corporate responsibility 
uh, as we kind of process that. Uh, but yeah, there's there's no easy easy way through this. Um, and this is where the 12 step program is, I think a good analogy. Nobody wants to go sit there and say, hi, I'm, I'm Ron. <laughs> this is, I'm an alcoholic or whatever, you know, you know, it, this is not an easy position to be in. Um, and, and unfortunately it's, it's a position we find ourselves in largely because it has become so politicized, uh, so alienating in many ways. Uh, you've got people who are, you know, gung ho about this, and they're they seem to be moving in all these different directions, and uh, it's hard to maybe get on that bandwagon. And then you got others who are just tired of talking about it, or just don't want anything to do with it, and that's not helpful either. It really is. It's, it's not a. There's not a lot of uh, unanimity in what to do about this, uh, and therefore the only thing you can do individually really is to start at the individual level with this kind of lamentation and begin to work at a community level where you can start to make a difference politically, uh, which is really where things have to go uh, to change. All right, thank you. Paula Boltz is asking, what specifically can an individual do on our own to prevent climate change? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the frustrating thing about it, uh, is there's nothing an individual can do specifically. Uh, as an individual. Now, again, individuals are part of systems and we're all part of uh, communities. We're all part of larger political structures and systems. And we can turn those systems uh, and those larger communities towards something, then we can do something. But uh, uh, you can recycle, you can uh, uh, go all electric, you can stop eating meat, you know, there's nothing you can do there <laughs> that's going to make any change uh, unless you start to move other people in the same direction. And this would involve some kind of community movement. All right, thank you. Um, here's another question from Karen Cudabay. Walter Brueggemann has said that one role of the church is to find what works and then magnify and amplify and celebrate those things. Mm -hmm. How might this transfer to the issue of climate change? What are you spotting and what should we be amplifying? <sighs> to be honest, there's not a lot that actually has demonstrated that it works. Um, we produce more emissions and uh, each year, uh, we, we, have not, we have not curbed anything, or you know, to use the pandemic metaphor, we haven't even come close to flattening the curve. Uh, it's, it's been continually uh, going escalating. Uh, even when we uh, bring renewables on board, all that does is add additional energy. It doesn't actually cut back on the amount of fossil fuels we're burning. So we're burning fossil fuels and adding more renewables and it takes more fossil fuels to produce the renewable. So it, it's a net loss even there. Uh, so I agree with what he says, with what, what Brueggemann says. Uh, you tell me what works and I'll be get behind it. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I don't have the answers for this. Uh, that's why I, I start at the individual level. I, I'm pretty confident that one can start to change lives at an individual level. Uh, and once one starts changing lives at an individual level, then hopefully that snowballs into political action. Um, and that's what I'd like to see. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I, I wish there was... Uh, I wish there was easy answers for, for some of these things. Uh, there, there really is not. Uh, and that's the, that's the hard part about climate change. And, and partly it's because it is so enmeshed with our whole economic system, which is really everything that surrounds us. Um, you know, our well-being, our, all the things that we think of as being modern, 
uh, it's all enmeshed in that. And so there's a lot at stake with this. Uh, we don't want to go back to the Stone Age, <laughs> nor do we uh, want to leave most of society aside while a few of us remain affluent. Um, we need to figure out a way of transitioning uh, away from fossil fuels with uh, uh, less energy, less consumption, less need. Uh, and this can only be done at a community level. It can only be done with politics, but it needs a changing of one's own heart, uh, changing of one's own uh, desires, one's own standards for what a, a good life is. And this is gonna to have to come about through individual thinking uh, and transformation. Uh, and this is where I think uh, the church, Christianity, um, other religions can make a difference. Uh, this is their business is, uh, is transforming us uh, into people with uh, desires that are more godlike. Uh, and I think uh, this would be God's wish in this point. <laughs> Thank you. I know we're almost out of time, so I'm going to invite anyone who would like to speak or make any additional comments to go ahead and unmute yourselves. Might have got it all in the comments. I guess, I'm not seeing any other. Wave your hand if you'd like to say anything in the last couple of minutes here. So do you think it involves a lot of innovation, scientific innovation to? Well, there's, there's always the hope for that. Um, if we can come up with a, a more efficient uh, and more productive energy source, for instance, uh, that would that would be a game changer. Something like uh, a fusion instead of a fission, nuclear fusion right. instead of fission. Um, but most of those things take decades to actually bring on bring into public use, uh, and so that that such a discovery could actually be a game changer in the near future seems very unlikely. Uh, so I, I really don't think there's a lot of need for scientific innovation. Um, right now, it's primarily a social problem. Uh, it's a problem of getting people on board and deciding what do we want a community to look like. Uh, and these are the these are the parameters. <laughs> you know, we have to burn much, 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 much less fossil fuel, and that means we're going to have much less energy. And what can we do with that? And we have to start to think in those terms. Uh, and we want to do it democratically. Uh, and that's a social issue as well. Uh, it would be easy to solve this uh, with authoritarianism. You know, one person standing up and saying, okay, this is what we're doing and we all have to do it because I said so. But that's not the society we live in nor is that the society we want to live in. Uh, so we need to do this democratically which means convincing each other of what's right and what's best. Uh, and anything that reduces fossil fuel consumption is good. And anything that does that's gonna slowly transform our society in terms of our economy, in terms of our social structures. Uh, and we just need to do that at a much rapid rate, much more rapid rate than, uh, than we're willing to, willing to think about, to be honest. Um, we'd like to keep thinking about it down the road. It's 2030, 2050, 2100. Um, that's what we're concerned about, not what we're going to do tomorrow. All right. Well, um, it is eight o'clock and I want to honor the, uh, the time limits of our time together. So thank you again, Ron. Really yeah. appreciated your thoughts and comments tonight. It was great having you here. And thanks to everyone else for coming. It's great having all of you here as well. And I wanna remind you that we have the second speaker next week, um, same time, a week from tonight, Thursday, seven o'clock, Amy Ballou of Regis University. So I encourage you to come back to that um, next week. If you know of anyone who is interested in the series, but wasn't here tonight,
they are going to be recorded and they'll be available uh, at a later point for anyone else if you'd like to hear it again or if you know of someone who uh, couldn't come tonight. So again, um, thank you all. Happy Earth Day. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all next week. And thanks again, Ron. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Good job, Erica. Thank you.